Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the DJ Podcast. Uh, it's been a while. It's been about two or three years since I have completed a podcast, and I'm back, and uh, in video format nonetheless. Uh, so I apologize in advance for the shitty lighting and stuff. I don't really know a whole heck of a lot about that type of uh, stuff in terms of video production, but I will potentially learn, uh, or you may have to suffer through this pretty bootleg setup. Anywho, uh, the moral of the story is I'm back, I'm podcasting again, uh, and I've got an amazing guest for everyone today by the name of Jeffrey Franca, who is the mastermind behind the project Ethno. He is an individual who, who produces his own music and just he just put out his very first mixtape called Musicology Volume 1, uh, which we discuss on the show today. Uh, and the kind of the funny thing about this interaction and getting back into podcasting overall comes from the fact that Jeffrey's manager, Keith, reached out to me uh, via email, replying to an email uh, that I had originally sent in 2019, which he we had kind of had some back and forth back then about getting another artist on the show uh, by the name of Boombox, who is phenomenal, uh, and who I, I would recommend everyone go check out. And anyways, in 2019 at the time, I reached out to Keith in an attempt to get Boombox on the show. Uh, like I said, we had a few emails back and forth, never panned out and uh, kind of just fell by the wayside. Uh, but maybe a month ago or so, uh, Keith reached out to me uh, again, uh, asking if I was still doing the show. And uh, long story short, uh, we exchanged a bunch of emails and uh, he brought this amazing artist by the name of, of Jeffrey, uh, by the name of Ethno, I suppose is his, his stage name, but he, he brought uh, Jeffrey's music to my attention and uh, I had a listen. Uh, Jeffrey was kind enough to come on the show and share some insight about his process becoming a solo artist, uh, about his background in the musical group by the name of Thievery Corporation, a trip hop production crew um, who's been making amazing music since the 90s. He talks about that. He, he, he brings uh, some of his insights into the global world and how music can potentially help there. Uh, and he also, I'm also realizing now that this is probably going to be super echoey and terrible audio as well. I'm recording in a, an awful place. So I might have to redo this. <laughs> On second thought, we're just going to power through. Uh, before we jump into the video with Jeffrey uh, describing Ethno, I would like to point out that I myself uh, am an artist as well. Uh, if you haven't listened to my uh, debut uh, LP, I suppose you could say. It's about 12 songs. It's called No Woman Lo-Fi. Check that out on Spotify. <clears throat> and even more importantly, October 1st, Sunday, October 1st. Uh, I just picked October 1st. I honestly didn't realize it was a Sunday, so shame on me there. But Sunday, October 1st, I will be putting out a brand new EP, a five-song instrumental uh, with some spoken word clips, uh, you know, and stuff like that weaved in and out. Uh, that will be coming out on October 1st. And stay tuned until the end of the episode. Uh, I actually have a debut of one of the songs played at the end of this uh, podcast. So if that's something that interests you, stay along until the end and check out uh, the first release off of that new EP. Like I said, it will come out on October 1st for everyone. Uh, it'll be on Spotify, Apple Music all the good spots that you listen to music at. So without further ado, here is my interview with Jeffrey Franca of Ethno and Thievery Corporation. All right. So Jeff, uh, what's going on? Thanks for joining the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to dig in with you. Yeah, this is, this is exciting. So Jeff just put out uh, his debut EP for the project Ethno, uh, which is your solo project, correct? Correct. Yeah. You, uh, it seems like you've had, uh, uh, like obviously a long career in music. What, what prompted you in, you know, two years ago in 2021 to start, uh, going down the more solo route as opposed to collaborating with 
uh, you know, like a band or uh, I know uh, obviously your background in Thievery Corporation uh, is a collective of, of artists. So can you kind of just walk us through like the process of going solo and like what that looks like? Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think that personally um, I was digging internally to find um you know some some freedom some inspiration uh behind creating and wanted to kind of start there and then and then let things blossom instead of like starting with all these moving parts and being like all right how are we going to get together for the first show <laughs> yeah so just kind of like an idea of just being able to fully autonomous autonomously create whatever was coming to me not not with like a you know not with like a concept really in mind just kind of like all right you know i'm going to start um focusing my production on one kind of project instead of like oh i have a song like this and i have a song like this and that was fun to make and really just tried to <clears throat> hone in the concept of of what ethno was um and and yeah you know spending a lot of time in bigger bigger um ensembles um definitely you know more personalities more mouths to feed more people to uh you know deal with and and while yes collaborating for me is probably the most productive um creative process like having a few cats writing a song together getting you know getting ideas from just not just your own brain um, can sometimes, you know, be a very productive process, but I've been learning a lot and, and teaching myself just how to get the sounds from my head into, into the music. And, and so, you know, whether it's been a, a different approach, maybe similar approach, but just with, you know, more of just like a free kind of like whatever comes out, you know, I don't have to, send it to a singer. I don't have to bounce it off. Anybody's like, Oh, that was, that was in there. You know, that was cool. And sometimes it makes it to the set. Sometimes it just hangs out on the hard drive, you know, but at yeah. least the process is happening. Yeah. And I mean, like what a level of freedom, right. That you get working by yourself. I mean, it is a double edged sword though, isn't it? Cause there's, there's no one there to help you when you get stuck, but you also get the satisfaction of like being free in a sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, you know, almost looking at it as like a, like a daily challenge, like, all right, what, what's in your head and what, what can you do production wise and performance wise to get that out? And yeah, it's been a great learning process. So yeah, you talk, you've mentioned that a couple of times and like, that is always the biggest struggle for musicians is like, is getting that, that sound in your head and then translating it. Was that something that you had uh, like experience um, in terms of like using DAWs uh, or like, you know, like digital projection, uh, production by yourself beforehand or is that something you a whole new skill set you had to pick up as well um i think i think um updating the sound with the ethno project you know i i i have a juno 60 roland analog synthesizer that i use for a lot a lot of stuff especially low end stuff um and while that instrument can be used in many different ways you know, I started to explore with like take, taking like uh, an 808 sample and and manipulating the pitch of it and the envelope and uh, getting a little more in the box um, with this project. I still use the Juno 60 for the majority of every synth that I have. I make a new sound, um, but I'm I'm starting to branch out and. A lot of times I'll I'll make the sound in the Juno and then I'll drop it into Ableton and then I'll use the drum rack to like transpose that sound or slide it around or you know kind of like almost resample the sound and um, and so that was that was a pretty cool you know re revelation to have where I could still be using my analog gear but then using the um, you know the compositional tools that like Ableton provides and to be able to to have some more modern sounding techniques and yeah that that process is just kind of always just like all right you know hopefully every day you find some new little thing you know because we all know how deep the, the programs can get and but yeah i think it goes back to like 
I, where I was, I actually went to music school back in college and, and, um, I, I wrote a lot of the music for my, uh, solo percussion recitals. And that was a process very similar where I, I had stuff in my head and I wrote it down and then I had to go learn it and actually perform it. So that was like, that's a little more extreme of, of like, a you know, trial and error type of thing, but same idea of just having like something that's like, all right, you hear this sound, which is like, all right, well, that means I want my bass to sound like this. And then you're like, all right, how do I, how do I do that? You know? And, and that process to me is kind of like the most fun part. You know, we, you do a lot of exploring, maybe check out some MIDI sounds, check out some analog sounds, figure out where, you know, where the song, you know, what the song needs. And that's a pretty fun process for me. That's like for you, that's kind of like, uh, like grabbing different things and like trying them on to see if it works. And then like just kind of coming up with just like whatever happens in the end is like the thing of beauty kind of, is that how, <laughs> what I'm hearing? Yeah, and I, I just got new monitors, uh, my second pair ever. I've had very basic KRK-5s. All that EP was mixed on KRK-5s um, for about 14 years. And now I have uh, some really nice barefoot monitors. And I've been going back and listening to some of my tracks and then a being them with some stuff on the monitors and being like, holy cow, like there's so much room to grow. You know, um, the barefoots really kind of show you all the space that's possible in a mix. And um, I'm recent. Um, hopefully today I'll be done uh, remixing a song that I've actually been performing out live. Sounds great in the system. But then I played it on the barefoots and I'm, I beat it with something. And then and then I started um, thinking about what I heard and what I could hear in the new speakers. And I just started completely re rebuilding the mix and it sounds a hundred times better oh that's so, awesome well, hell but yeah, it was dude. the sound that was up here you know that was like all right well if, if that sounds like that then why doesn't mine sound like that and then i started massaging it figuring out like you know basically checking off of things like well it's not that it's not that turns out the kick drum i didn't love you know and a big system obviously sounds fine you know it's pumping but like um i started messing around with with really uh defining the low end and and it turns out i like the mix better right now you know so uh i guess it's all about just going through that process of what's in your head and how do you get that onto tape you know or in the box absolutely and so you, you obviously you have a, a percussion background would you say that that's where a lot of your songs start is from a beat or I see you have like a lot of mallet instruments in your music, which I love. Uh, is that kind of a starting point for you for ideas or what does that look like instrument selection wise? Yeah, I guess it, I guess it kind of varies. Some days it will be like, you know, you go in there and you're like, all right, this whole thing's done. It's in my head. I guess got to work to get it out. And some days you're like, let me scroll through some like one shot sounds and see if there's a snare drum that inspires me to like, write a whole song. Oh, that's that snare sound. Cool. Then the, then the whole song writes itself around that snare sound or same thing for like, maybe, um, you know, like, uh, just like a one shot chord or something like, Oh, that's a cool chord. Now, why don't I take that sample it, slide it around, transpose it and make a bunch of different chords off that chord. And then maybe another chord, you know, with a different sound. Um, so yeah, I guess sometimes it's in there and it's like, you're like, all right, I got to go in there and get this out. And sometimes it's like, ah, like that one, that one little snare drum inspired me to like write this song today. And it was like, that was the sound that the inspired, like the the imagery, you know, in my head. Yeah, it just um, took, it, took it and ran with it. Yeah, you know, like, I think that happens probably a lot more than, especially if I'm like, saying, oh, today I'm going to go and download 30 song sounds off Splice. And like the last one I download, I'll use in a song. The funny part is typically when I do that, by the time the song's over, the original part's out. Yeah, you swap it out with something, uh, something more original. Yeah, or it's yeah, or it's just like, you know, that was just the sound that got me started. And I didn't want to have to like make the whole song. Like, well, are we still with the first sound? It's like, no, nah, throw it out. Now we got a new song. That was just what got you going, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's another fun part of the, the realization process of the music, you know? Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. You mentioned that. Cause yeah, sometimes it is just like the hardest part is starting. So you get a nice loop and you're like, all right, we can build off this. And then 
just go ahead and throw that away and bring it something cooler. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. You know, like if it if it gets you like a cool chord progression, it's just you know, it's just a placeholder. I I kind of had this philosophy, like this justification when I started ethno because I've always been very like hesitant to just like buy a serum and use bass sounds that other people use and like everything had to be like, individual which hopefully comes through in the in the in the music but um i i had this revelation where i was like you know painters used to have to buy have to make paint and and make their canvases you know and then all of a sudden like michaels came along and you could go to the store and buy paint and buy canvases and like did it make the painter any less prolific that they bought the paint or if they made the paint you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um i think it's just about the final product and, and what the art says you know um yeah that's true so that, yeah, was kind of my, that was my justification for like you know starting to be like well i didn't make this kick drum with my synthesizer like no nope that's just a one shot kick drum and you used it and it's okay you know other people right, do that yeah, there's like there, there are a lot of purists out there these days but like at the end of the day if you're making cool stuff that people resonate with does it really matter i mean if you're borrowing some sounds or not if it slaps it slaps right you know yeah and if it gives you inspiration and a feeling i mean that's what it is you know i mean i'm not saying i'm over here just copy and paste and stuff out of splice sessions or anything but yeah you know just to just to start the creative process or to you know to just start your day like hey but why don't i go and see if there's a cool thing that jogs my jogs my creativity that i could then you know run with and create a whole song from but yeah that that's that's always a funny a funny thing you know because i mean at this point we've gone full full circle around like production history like from you know figuring out how to put sound on a wax ball to like two turntables and a mixer to like now we have people that dj on eight turntables <laughs> it's like i don't know why you need all those but i guess it looks cool it certainly does look cool i'll give them i'll give them that <laughs> but yeah, i don't know what the point is yeah those extra four decks but uh, all right everybody i wanted to take uh, an opportunity here in the middle of the interview to actually play some of jeffrey's music he was kind enough to allow us to play some some of the songs here on the podcast so Let's jump into Jeffrey's first single off the record. It's called Leaf Water.
Let's talk about uh, musicology volume one point. Uh, is it just, do you pronounce it just volume one point or point one? Sorry. Uh, I don't know. It's probably volume, um, volume period one. one. Gotcha. It, it's, <laughs> an, it's, it's an amazing EP. Uh, you just put it out. Um, uh, it came out on September 1st. September 1st. So brand new music. Uh, it's amazing. There's a lot of like themes of awakening, of mysticism, of, connection of consciousness of like freedom in general is that kind of the angle like that you wanted to go with ethno because i know you mentioned you wanted to create a solo project that was cohesive it sounded like um what what exactly is kind of the vision for ethno in, in this first musical project you know i think with what you were alluding to before with like the message and the two vocal songs typically uh when i make music there has to be like some sort of uh, message um, I'm, um, you know, a disciple of Bob Marley, Fela Kuti, Miles Davis, Stevie Wonder, you know, all the greats. And when it comes down to it, these are people who are making music that not only change the art world, but change the political world, change their communities, helped people realize, you know, some of the terrible things that are going on, went on through a, a medium that typically is the most universal language that we know, you know, laughter and music, you know. And and uh, so whether or not my music's instrumental or not, um, that's where I'm coming from. Like some sort of inclusion, like I think the blending of the cultures of the sounds is indicative of, the name ethno and also just like my goals for like world unity, you know, like people of ignorant, you know, beliefs that think things are supposed to be a certain way and things shouldn't mix and all this. It's like my music is basically the antithesis of that, you know, it's like anything can mix, anything can blend, you know, we are, while yes, our our differences are are, are the beauty of, of of you know existence. However, you never know. Like who was the first person to put honey mustard on chicken fingers? You know, like somebody probably thought that was crazy. And there's a riot at Roy Rogers, you know, and and now it's just commonplace. So if you don't try to mix things, you never know like what what you could get. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you do an amazing job of that on this record. I mean, there's all sorts of different uh, influences, uh, I would say. I mean, in terms of like the the rhythmic stuff, I mean, you get a lot of like the Afro beats kind of in there. You get a little bit of the like the Caribbean uh, in like Latin American flavor as well. Um, and yeah, and then throw on top of that, you know, all like the, the synths and then you throw in some uh, the, the, the marimba and things like that. I think you do a, like an amazing job of bringing all these different elements together. Um, and to that point, I mean, what, what, what role can music play, uh, 
in such a divided world, like how can music like this actually unite us and bring us together, do you think? I think uh, I'm all about the sneak attack, right? <clears throat> um, you know, some people would say something like, oh, I don't, I don't like reggae. I'd be like, hmm, what about this song? Oh, I love that song. Oh, that's a reggae song. You know, like, yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's all sorts of, you know, ways you could go to describe that phenomenon where somebody writes something off because their experience or like, you know, the first reggae song I heard was like, maybe not authentic and didn't speak to me, you know, or um, maybe you didn't realize how wide the reggae genre goes and that technically, you know, hip hop came from reggae because a Jamaican New York DJ named Cool Herc was the guy who started hip hop period end of story you know and like that that graduation from Jamaican culture into US culture and and then us putting our spin on it and all that like I feel like just knowing that that kind of history about anything is is what can help our society and understanding history recognizing it not trying to whitewash it or rewrite it i feel like music is 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 like the sneak attack because you probably got some racist white dude that knows every word to doggy style <laughs> yeah you know like it's like Oh, we only want, you know, we only like your culture when it like fits for our fun times, you know, and it's like, and maybe I'm generalizing too much, but, but just, just to make a point, you know, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that if they really knew the history of their music, like maybe they would have a little more appreciation for certain cultures that they might be ignorant to, you know, instead of saying, you know, this land is my land, this land is my land. It's like, you know land is our land it wasn't our land <laughs> we took it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right but yeah you you, i think you, you you raise a great point which is like music is uh like a very visceral thing where uh yeah you, you uh like to your point of, of saying um you know here oh, you say you don't like country music or whatever here's like a country song that you might like you can't really deny that which puts your mind you know, it turns, it can turn people's minds inside out, which at that point I think is a great launching point for like the next part of the conversation, which is like, all right, how can we actually get over this ignorance? So I, I'm with you hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, Fela said music is the weapon, you know? Um, and that always has stuck with me. It's like, you know, and anything in life, like I was using this example recently of trying to get somebody to, to wrap their head around an idea. And it's a long-term idea. I can't really go into details, but the, uh, a lot of people were kind of like, like hounding, like this, let's ha it's gotta happen now. It's gotta happen now. And I was like, I feel like we're, we're like, Hey daddy, can I have a piece of candy? Hey daddy, can I have a piece of candy? Hey dad. And like, there needs to be like a, you know, maybe if you stop asking mm -hmm. after dinner, you'll get like an, an ice cream cone or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> and just like that, that idea of people not realizing because they're hit over the head with it constantly through media and this and that, that they might be a little more loving than, than, than things are feeling, you know, and, and with the constant, you know, dichotomy of our society with very polarized beliefs, you know, you never know, like, if somebody stopped and helped you with their flat tire, who they vote for, but they stopped and helped you with your flat tire, you know, like, why is it such a big, why are people getting so, you know, upset over all these things? And I think it's because it's like, just constantly in their face and nobody's like taking this time to be like, oh, well, I can't change you by telling you, you need to change. I need to display it through music or through my lifestyle or through some sort of thing. Cause if I keep telling you, Nope, you're wrong. Nope, you're wrong. You're stupid. That's not going to work. Yeah. Like people will never respond well to that. You know, like keep asking for candy. You're not going to get it. You know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you take a step back and just, just kind of eat your, clear your plate and eat your dinner. Maybe you'll get some ice cream, you know? 
I don't know. It's it's a tough world out there to think about fixing, but it is. But I think it's I think it's so important that artists like yourself are making this music and making uh you know feeding a, a culture that celebrates unity and celebrates connection and celebrates yeah like the the ability for you to be an individual, but also the fact that you're actually not an individual because we're all part of one consciousness at the same time, and that paradox. And, and just living in that paradox as opposed to trying to fight it is, uh, I don't know, it, it seems to be like at the core of, of kind of what you're doing and a lot, a lot of what, what uh, is at the core of really the Denver music scene in general. But before we get to that, I would love to talk about, first and foremost, like the live experience. When, when folks come out to see Ethno, what can they expect? And, and on that note, I would love to hear about your experience uh, playing at Malwolf because that is uh, what an incredible place. Would love to hear about that. Yeah, so where yeah, do you live? Uh, I live in uh, I live in the Chicago land area right now. Nice, yeah. Beautiful time of year. Well, it, is, uh, it falls. Avery's coming up there in in October. You should, we'll get you out to the show. Oh, let's do it. Yeah, I, I would love to. You you asking about Meow Wolf specifically? Well, yeah. Let's 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 start there, and then yeah, kind of we can maybe go from there and talk about the live aspect because I, one thing that I noticed that I thought was so cool is um you know when you're DJing, you also kind of have, you have your um, marimbas and, and some other instruments there to kind of accent the live performance, which I think is uh, pretty unique and, and really cool. Yeah. So I definitely do a lot of DJ gigs um, that I love doing um, where I'm playing some original music and some other people's music and a lot of vibe curating type of things. And I love that, but I'm a, I'm a musician. I'm a first, I'm a performer like of instruments. So to not to stand up there, I mean like, yeah, as convenient as it would be to not lug all that stuff around. Like, I don't think it does. It doesn't scratch the surface of who I am as an artist without some live interaction of performing instruments. And the goal is, you know, to really expand on that and to have more, ability to display my um, interest in, in performing live. So as resources become available, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, shows become more, um, more viable to add, you know, musical production, visual production to, I feel like that would be, that's definitely something that's important to me. Um, but, you know, breaking down my actual marimba and bringing it on a plane is just impossible, you know? Yeah. Um, so I've got the electric uh, pro mallet station, which is a MIDI controller. Um, and I play a lot of my leads on that. And I have it connected to an invisible computer that's under the table that feeds all the information to the MIDI. And then that goes straight into the mixer. So I can have my DJ track, and my top level, uh, top layer, melodic percussion. And then on the other side, I've got congas and I've worked a couple parts into the show um, where I get to display some of my hand drumming uh, passion. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so I, I hope to expand on that. I hope to be able to, you know, I'm, you know, who knows whether that it could be deconstructed or more constructed. Like, I'd love to do a looper pedal set. Um, yeah, that's know, what I was going to ask. If you played around with any, like, the five-track loop stations or anything like that, because I feel like that would lend itself well to your sound, um, and, like, just building things. I agree. And and having having a space to, like, you know, once – if you're DJing, it's like once you hit play on that track, that's what it's going to be until you decide to mix it in another track. and question is when and what when where why how and why right um but if you're if if there you know i've seen fkj perform and like there's definitely some tracks that he's like you know more dj style but then like he'll like make up a song right there and i'm like that's something i can that's what i do all day you know but i don't have the boss uh five channel looper um i'm in the process excuse me in the process of trading another piece with a friend to get that so i can just explore to see what it is um and and potentially use my multi-instrumentalist uh, approach with something like that it could be could be a cool addition to the set because right now if if you get to see a show 
uh, it's very, it just, it just goes. It's all the same, all 150 BPM, very tribal, like uh, possessed, uh, or like, uh, you know, trance like state when the tempo stays consistent, half time, double time. And, and uh, so there's not much, you know, it's kind of just like you get on, you go for the ride. There's not like much back time or a pause for this or that. Uh, so that could probably be something that could, you know, eventually when, when people are more in tune with like my songs, once they maybe listen to them a few times, but they come to a show, want to hear a song. Uh, right now, people mainly don't know my music when they come to the show. I mean, I haven't played one since the music's com been coming out this summer, but um, so it'll be interesting my next show to see what what people are thinking about. But um, but yeah, the uh, you know just being able to to cater to that moment that's a little more maybe a little less like ecstatic and a little more you know kind of introspective mm -hmm. nice yeah I, I would i would love to see once you get uh get some of that uh, think of that loop station rocking and and hear some of the crazy stuff that you'll come up with because i'm i imagine it'd be a lot of fun so you mentioned obviously you you come back from a, a, a you come from a background of being behind the kit and drumming um when did when did you get into djing and production and stuff like that well i got into production actually in college was the first time i mean you know, it's kind of interesting that I think a huge part of why we're where we're at, where we're at is when everybody started getting Apple computers and GarageBand was, was on it, you know, was mm -hmm. a pretty, if you make noise, you know, that's a pretty like, oh yeah. my God, you know, I mean, I could make this noise and this noise and play them both at the same time. And so that was like, you know, obviously whatever my, by the time I had graduated college or halfway through college i probably got my first apple you know creative macbook thing and and um that was what i got reason on by propeller head i got reason i actually had fruity loops on my when i was 18 so yeah it was like as soon as i got a computer of my own you know because in my house growing up we were we we weren't very technologically savvy and you know by the time I graduated high school, we're still on AOL, probably. <laughs> wow. You know, so it's not like, it's not like I like got to college and like knew what to do with this ethernet stuff. I didn't, you know, I was like, oh, it's just faster. I, I don't know. But I got Fruity Loops and I was like, okay, well, I started making beats and Fruity Loops, um, some free version of the software. And so it was, it was automatically like, I hear like two records that stick out to me as far as like, wow, how did they do that? Yoshimi Battles of Pink Robots. Okay. By the Flaming Lips. Um, and Dave Friedman produced that. And he is like the king of blending live electronic orchestral everything into like one, one thing. And it sounds like it's perfect. It doesn't sound like, oh shit, the jar is too full, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so Dave Friedman's approach and then my other main guy is Quest Love and oh, when yeah. Phrenology came out it just really sparked my ears you know I was like well how are they doing this and so I got you know my first little four channel Alesis interface and I plugged in the mics and I started recording and I was like wow this sounds terrible <laughs> why, why doesn't it sound like you know John Bonham or why doesn't it sound like Dave Grohl and um i realized that you need more stuff <laughs> and this is so this is all you know i i didn't do anything recording until about 22 years old or 23 years old started recording drums and figuring out like all right well what is this all about why does why do certain drums sound like a piece of paper and certain drums sound great you know same process i'm going through in my studio right now treating the room uh, but from then on, it was just like, all right, if I'm the drummer and I got the beat, then like, as long as I can record the drums, like most people, you hear a song like, oh, cool, chord progression. I mean, even like one of the most badass singers ever with a huge catalog of music has some kind of whack drum beats sometimes. And Sade, like, I love her, you know, but like, yeah. the songs are great, but I'm like, wow, that drum part is like just literally 
Yamaha synth program number one. But so I kind of realized like having having the knowledge of the swing and of like how the beat, how the, how a groove is built was like kind of gives you a leg up as a producer. Certain guys like, oh, yeah, and I, you know, I hear a chord progression. I know exactly what it is, voicings and all that. Like, yeah, I, I can get close with that. But like you can always mess around with that. But if you can't make a beat swing and hit, then like your song, if it's a dance song, you know, it's not going to be doing what you needed to do so i felt like taking the drummer approach to production was was eye-opening because it was like oh if i can already do this and this that's almost the whole song you know i mean yeah the, the beat is really i mean it, it is the heartbeat of the song right i mean it is it's everything um without it nothing else goes so yeah if you got that foundation then the rest just figures itself out in a lot of a lot of ways yeah i mean that figures itself out is a very interesting thing because a lot of times if the beat sits right then you start hearing things you know and things come to you through the air through whatever is inspiring you from that beat or like maybe there's a little harmonic in the snare that's like connecting with the kick that like all of a sudden gives you like a melodic idea you know um so yeah i agree yeah and, and maybe yeah, but maybe there's something to like the fact that you're actually like if you're actually moving i don't know like the motion of it like i feel like can help spur ideas too right just literally moving with the song uh, itself which you you're forced to do if you're behind the kit so hey guys here again just want to quickly introduce another one of jeffrey's songs this is a song called awake again uh, and this features uh, a vocal performance from celestine mono who uh, is a new artist that looks like a new vocalist uh, she does an amazing job here, and Jeffrey does a great job on the production as well. I find it to be one of my favorite songs on the project, so have a listen now. Thanks. 
Um, can you kind of walk us through, like, so how did you go, how did you find your way uh, to the to Thievery Corporation? And, and um, you know, can you kind of tell that story, that origin story of of, uh, of that group and, and where you guys are at today? Yeah, so those dudes, they um, started putting on music in 1995, 1996. Um, would have made me 11 years old. Um, so I'm from D.C. or I'm from Northern Virginia. D.C. was my city. You know, it's the it's the metropolitan area there. And um, eventually spent my adult early adult years living in D.C. And um, I had first started a thievery corporation at a friend's house in college. And it was probably a song called Marching the Hate Machines because I, I, I remember saying it sounded like flaming lips in the club. And that song, Wayne Coyne actually sings on, on the record. And then I just didn't think anything about it. I thought they're from some, I thought they were kind of some European down tempo trip hop thing, you know. And then I moved back home after college and I started gigging like, you know, basically seven nights a week in D.C., a lot at this place called Bossa where it was, it was right next to their studio. And that's where a lot of the guys would come hang. And so I found out, Oh, these guys are actually from DC, but they don't have a drummer. They're a DJ bass band. So, ah, whatever. I never really, never really thought that, you know, I was going to change the approach or they were going to change the approach. Um, and, uh, and one thing led to the next. I ended up playing with um, all the members of like the live band, including Roots and Z, uh, who were the first two MCs, the Rastas, to, to, to sing with the DJ duo before there was any live things. It was two singers and two DJs. And, and then so that the whole live band, bass, guitar, percussion, all those guys, horns, they played every, every Wednesday at the 18th Street Lounge. And I ended up getting into that band which then made it so <laughs> if you can live in a van with those guys, then you might be able to live in the tour bus with those guys, plus a bunch of other singers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the hardest part in that band is not the music. It's just the amount of people, you know, and like we, we all have deepest love for each other, but you know, just like any family, it's like, it's just it, the more people you add, the more confusing things can get. But, um, mm -hmm. but so I guess being kind of adopted by the CI family, which was the Wednesday night band kind of like, at least let them know that, you know, we all get along, <laughs> which is a good start. And, uh, and we all love each other. So that then, then, uh, one of the percussionists out of two left and, uh, instead of, I had been doing some drum recordings on culture of fear. That was the first record I played on, and uh, they suggested bringing a drum set on stage and just me playing the beats. And over the years, like 13 now, we have refined our approach to the live sound by employing Ableton stems for certain synthesizers and um, other high-end sounds. But when I started, I was literally drumming along full volume blasting through the pa with a mastered track going through a cdj and we all played with a mastered track so, so you like played on top the drums on were top. still in. the drums were still, the drums in, there. Were just still in i had to play exactly what it was otherwise it sounded like terrible you know <laughs> if i played anything different than exactly what because it was going like two drummers at once one changes it's like well shit here we go um wow now I, I i i quickly we started to realize like all right let's make this better and better and better and you know some new people came in myself included and started remaking stems for old songs like we used to have to do songs sometimes i had the bass in it and we would mute the bass on stage because you can't have two basses it'll just be terrible phasing issues yeah. and and we didn't have any access to the old songs to take anything out. All we had was a mastered file, right? So I started thinking like, what if I remade these old songs so we could take things out? And cause like, you know, singers would be cool for like two weeks and then all of a sudden they'd be like, I'm sick of singing with this song with my vocals already in the track, you know? Yeah. That's my singer voice impression. 
very generic. I'm not I'm not pointing anybody at. <laughs> um and and so it was like yo what, let's avoid this like let's let's remake these songs so like the first one that got remade was lebanese blonde actually because that was a mastered track we had no stems for that and um and our sound engineer now who, who uh, is an amazing producer and musician as well he did it and brought it in we were like wow cool like that works you know it's, it was a little different in certain timbres but not i mean with the whole band playing now we can take the drums out take the bass out take the sitar out take everything out and only have like the perfect everything else is live you know so that, that it took a while you know many many it's a it's a constantly evolving thing to try to make it more streamlined um a big one was realizing that the we used to re when i first joined the band they would burn a cb every day to put in the CDJs that uh, had a different set list for, for each wow. night. So somebody would have to go make the set list, format it, burn a CD, and here's tonight's show, you know? And that was just so it was in order, so it's easy when you're DJing to be like one, two, three, four, five, right? Yeah. So then when we started doing the Ableton thing, we were doing the same thing. We were reprogramming the APC every day so that track song one was number one song two was number two and i was like guys what if every song had a number associated to the pad and it stays that number for example vampires is 44 right so whenever we play vampires you hit 44. it leaves a little bit up to potential mistakes like oh i hit the wrong pad or i read the wrong number off the set list or it was too dark between songs i couldn't see but whatever um it freed us up so now literally we could be like you know in the morning or even like right before the show we'd be like no change it up you know and just just move it around and without having to reprogram a cd a hard drive or an apc 40. so yeah. it's come a long way you know it's come a long way as far as like what we're doing to make the show happen we've put our heads together and and we've come up with a pretty good pretty good process Hell yeah. And you guys are, you're doing, you're, are you on like tour right now? Or are you just kind of, are you guys doing like one-off gigs at the moment or how's it? Yeah, we're doing like weekend. We we had a big year last year on the road and, um, you know, just doing kind of select dates this year. Uh, we're getting ready to go to Saudi Arabia next week for one show. Oh, wow. It could be, I think it's going to be beautiful. I just, uh, it's a lot of travel, but you get those frequent flyer miles, you know? Yeah. What is that? Like a 20 hour flight? It's a bunch of fights. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, well yeah. I mean, amazing experience though. Yeah, it's going to be great. I'll have 36 hours in Saudi Arabia before we turn around. I'll do as much as I possibly can. Oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, and you're, I saw you guys were doing a show in Denver soon with uh, DJ Shadow, who's awesome. Um, so that'll be a great show. Yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. It's at a great, great venue called the Mission Ballroom. And, um, it'll be a good debut for Fever Corporation. At that venue amazing um and then uh i guess one thing i, I want to talk about before we kind of wrap up here is uh just the denver music scene in general yeah i've been out there a few times uh just as a visitor uh but uh, there's just something different about denver where it's got such a unique vibe to it there seems to be like a lot of these people that are going to resonate with your type of music there um so i would love to hear just yeah your perspective on the denver music scene and how long have you how long have you been uh, a Denver resident or Colorado resident, I suppose. Yeah, I um, I started touring in Colorado probably about 15 years ago. And I felt the same thing. I'd come here and be like, why am I going home? At that time was the green rush and the amount of gigs and, and good paying gigs and uh, opportunities to just be creative in a space where people were, you know, expanding the the legal market of marijuana was very beneficial to everybody here. And then slowly this like migration of a lot of amazing artists started happening like like a waterfall into Denver. And Colorado has always been known for you know, it's appreciation of music, 
you know, more recently, like the surge in, in young producers and, you know, the obviously pretty lights phenomenon and being local here, like that was a big thing. And there's still people that, you know, I mean, with his resurgence, which is such a great thing to see um, them back and performing. Uh, just like I, I, I wasn't really on that wave. I was maybe like next to it while it was happening but never you know it was always kind of like talk with pretty lots to be like oh man without thievery and so it was like this kind of like shift of like thievery becoming like okay we're going into legacy status and then this these young guys that are taking you know our sound and their sound and running with it um and adding new more modern production to it and, and you know like that you kind of see this shift of like you know the the legends becoming the legacies and the young people becoming the legends and all that happens here. You know, there's, there's a huge scene. The, what makes it possible is the fans and the interest from the community around here to get weird and to dance like nobody's watching and the appreciation that people have for that live music experience, whether it's a DJ or a live band, um, you know, Cervantes, is a huge reason why I believe our scene shout out Scott Morrill and Adam Stroll and Duncan and Josh and all the people there that have spent, you know, the last 15, 16 years just creating a home, a safe place for people to practice their art, to go to shows, you know, to, to hang out, to build a community. Um, that's like our that's our home and the respect from everybody on every side of that place for each other is is what you'd like to see in every venue it's a full-on family and that is another reason why i think is a big a big part of you know having a place as a musician where you can go and and walk in at the end of the night and people are like hey you know, there's only 30 minutes left. Come on in. Good to see you again. You know, just like the understanding that musicians need music too. So like they make it possible. And, and I mean, now we've, I mean, hands down, Denver is the live music capital of the world. Colorado. Okay. I like it. I, I think there's some people around that might disagree, but I like that you're staking the flag in. Let's, let's End go. Let's run with it. Spend a week here. And and tell me if you can even remember your name afterwards. Like, <laughs> every night of the, between Red Rocks, Red Rocks is obviously a huge draw. People come from all over the world to see their favorite band of Red Rocks. You know what I mean? So True. the tourism behind the music is also here. But there's, yeah, it's unmatched. I might it's just move to Denver right man. now. I, I'm getting hyped. I, I, I've always had a great time every time I'm there. And I mean, it is, it is such an amazing, yeah, just like not even just musicians, but like artists in general, it seemed they can find a home there, right? All sorts of artists. The food scene's blowing up. Like Denver is the one, you know, the, the, the pockets of diversity are not necessarily shown in like the, the kind of younger scene and community. Um, but we do have pockets of diversity out in different neighborhoods, the more international population and African American population. Big one here is, you know, we got a lot of white kids, we got a lot of Hispanic people. And, you know, that's great. I'm used to being around more of like being from DC, just like a, a whole kind of global, you know, you go to a shopping center, like, oh, get your Afghan kebab, get your Indian spices here. You know, it's like all there. And and Denver is a little more spread out with that. And that's, I guess, my only gripe because the culture and the community, you can't find it anywhere. I mean, we we basically legalized all drugs at this point, at least the, the ones that I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, Um uh, and and the and the progress, you know, and we're talking about like psilocybin and 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 marijuana, and like that's great, you know that. Uh, and I'm I'm not saying I'm I'm a very frequent user of of um, of psilocybin, but it's nice to know that like I'm not going to get a felony if I get caught with a mushroom in my pocket. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. Yeah, and absolutely. and then that freeing people up to experiment with 
you know, more, more rustic forms of mental health medication, you know, like, uh, mm-hmm. psilocybin treatments. And I call it rustic because it was happening before it only just became prohibited, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that naturally, once again, lending itself to like a music community, but you know, everything hey. kind of like comes back to that. And beautiful nature. I mean, Colorado's got a little bit of every, all, all the stuff you need to get your mental health like dialed in, doesn't it? It does. And, and I think one thing, especially being from the East Coast, where I feel like a lot of the energy I felt being from there was like, you know, what are you going to do next? Or when are you going to, I don't know, get a real job? Or when are you going to like, it's just, all, you know, get married, have kids and go to bed at 9 p.m. every night. You know, it's just like I, that that never really resonated with me. So, you know, moving to a place where quality of life is kind of like first and foremost, what people care about instead of like some social elite status, a lot of acceptance around here, which is cool. That's awesome. And you got a beautiful, uh, beautiful crib here out up in the mountains. I mean, you got an amazing place to make music and get inspired. One last question before you, before uh, we wrap up and we can kind of share, um, you know, your, your socials and stuff like that. Uh, what, I mean, just like for, for folks who, who look at, uh, you and, and see all that you have done over the last, you know, 15 years or so, 20 years as a musician, like what advice would you have for folks who want to like do what you do and live their dream doing music full time? Yeah, I'd say, um, start now. Like that's the best advice is just take yourself seriously. Know that everybody had to start somewhere at some point. And that's, that's really it. Like I, even now I have this voice in my head. that's like, oh yeah, well, when, when, you know, the next thing is like, hold on, like, look at what, what is this? Like what's going on here? And, and, you know, there's always something, you know, musicians, artists always struggle like, oh, I put out an EP and then the next day it felt like I had never accomplished anything. And it's like, I, I don't really get that because I don't, I try not to put too much emphasis on any one thing just start now take yourself seriously now go get your cuts and bruises now like it's just it's now it's all now like if you're a drummer you know there's a beat that you can play that nobody else can play because it's you playing it, you know and whether it's the same on page or whatever you've got your own feel somebody's gonna like that whether it's not for everybody who knows but don't don't just spend all your time making i gotta make myself available for everybody you already are just, yeah. just just do it just start now and go out and don't think like oh yeah well in a few years from now when i'm when i'm better yeah once i get that you know, one more plug in i just need this plug in i just need this that yeah that, that yeah, conversation you know, that's just your yeah that that never ends yeah and it, and it can be and it can be you know very um it can inhibit your your creative output if, if there's always something that's like oh yeah well on the next one the this and that it's just like i don't know i mean take yourself seriously start now and you will get the results you want everybody it happens at, at a different pace but that's just life you know wise words Wise words, Jeff. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, let's wrap up. Uh, um, do you have any dates you want to plug coming out uh, for uh, Ethno or uh, Thievery Corporation? Yeah. Um, Ethno is next big show is in Denver on November 18th. Uh, I'm, I'm playing a show with Flamingosis, Recess, and Nightcap, which is a new band with um, Ian Gilly from Recess. And Josh Fairman from Sun Squabby and Adam Deitch is on drums. It's kind of like a live electric hybrid night, uh, the second night of a two-night Flamingosis run. And I'm actually musical directing. After I get off this, I have to go start, or not start, but finish working on uh, some of that stuff for the first Flamingosis live band. So I don't know if you know uh, Flamingosis, but uh, Aaron is a uh, Brooklyn-based producer who really specializes in like latin rare groove flips and so we're gonna make a seven piece latin funk band out of his tracks okay so like a lot a lot of it will be based on the original samples that he sampled you know so we're i'm like transcribing all this kind of like 
Latin funk that he then put a backbeat behind. So it's it's a pretty big process and it's the first one. So there's a lot of like prep work, a lot of same idea with thievery, like some of those he only has the masters for. So I got to go back and recreate the parts so that when we do the Ableton thing, it's not like. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, so that's the next big ethno show. Um, that's all on one night. That's a big night. And then uh, thievery has, um, I think, the new place in Chicago is a place called Radius. Um, yep. in chicago and then and with dj shadow and the day before is uh, mission ballroom in denver and uh yeah i'm just you know getting ready for winter i got a bunch of wood to chop it's already getting cold and uh other than that just yeah a few big shows this fall and just really getting the studio dialed awesome good stuff and uh once again, great job on the EP, Musicology, Volume 1. Amazing, amazing record. Everyone, please go listen to it and go, uh, if you were in the Denver area or, you know, like you said, Denver's a music tourism city, fly in November 18th for the big show. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you. I really, uh, it was, you know, it's nice to speak with you. I I feel like I have questions for you too, but um uh... You got to ask all the questions today. So <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. Uh, maybe next time we'll have you back on. We can uh, flip the script. But uh, in the meantime, thanks so much, Jeff. And uh, appreciate you having, uh, having you on the show. Hey, right on. I appreciate you. Uh, we'll be in touch about Chicago. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into the show and supporting Jeffrey's mission and his music. Please go check out Ethno and Musicology Volume 1. Uh, and all of his other singles. He's got a bunch of other singles that he has released over the last couple of years, which are very nice. So go check that out and uh, you know, be sure to get out to Denver and see some of his music in person. I, I know I will be trying to myself uh, as soon as possible because I love Denver and uh, I'm a huge fan of, of what Jeffrey's doing. So on that note, here is some new music from yours truly. Here's a new DJ Pod song. Uh, this will be featured on my upcoming release coming out on October 1st. Uh, here it is. It's a song called A Long Look at Lost Friend. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you.